It was a cold and misty early afternoon in December 1745. Light snow fell down on the Prussian army, slowly approaching the small village of Kesselsdorf. They had been chasing their adversaries with great reluctance, echoed by their commander, Frederick the Great's mentor, Prince Leopold I, also known as the Old Sauer. Inside the town, Saxon Field Marshal Frederick Augustus, Count Utowski, was relatively confident awaiting the impending battle. Kesselsdorf was well fortified, his Saxons outnumbered the Prussians, and he knew an even larger army was approaching to reinforce him. Then, the old de Sauer ordered his army forward in a ferocious frontal charge against the fortified positions, despite facing superior numbers. After the Battle of Sor, Frederick made sure his army remained on the battlefield for a few days to show the world the Prussians were in fact victorious. Considering his army was outnumbered nearly 2 to 1, propaganda could quickly turn that around. All the while, Frederick received news of his generals scoring victories against irregulars behind front lines deep in Prussian territory. He also received optimistic dispatches from his envoy negotiating peace with the English. Admittedly, things were looking pretty good for the Prussians, and the king was certain peace was imminent. But it was wishful thinking. Maria Theresa was dead set on the destruction of Prussia and the king personally. Frederick's personal account in the history of my own times reveals the fortitude of the empress degenerated sometimes into obstinacy. She was a woman intoxicated at having recovered the imperial dignity for her descendants. Occupied solely by the smiling prospects of futurity, she thought her grandeur would be degraded should she negotiate with a prince whom she accused of rebellion as with an equal. After Sor, his supplies and army were exhausted to the degree that he marched his army back towards Silesia by early October. Frederick traveled towards Berlin while the rest of his army under the Old de Sauer crossed the border on October 19th. Despite his optimism, the war chest was running empty and Frederick actively pursued a new loan from either France or England, whoever was willing to help. On the Austrian side, things were moving as well. The Austrians planned to augment the Saxon army at Dresden before launching a winter campaign directed against Brandenburg and perhaps Berlin. First, they planned to surprise attack the Old Sauer, winter quartered in Halle. Then, they would push his army back all the way to Magdeburg. Diverting from waging war in Silesia, an attack against the relatively unprotected Brandenburg and its capital could be a fatal danger for Frederick. If this assault materialized, it would circumvent Frederick's army stationed in Silesia entirely. It would be a disaster. But the Prussian king was very well informed. Upon his arrival in Potsdam, Frederick's sources among the Saxon court informed him the next Austrian attack was to launch from Saxony, directed against Brandenburg. Then news reached him from the Russian court, where the Tsarina publicly announced she would support Saxony if they faced an attack. So he rightly grew more worried. Uncharacteristic as it was for the Austrians, they once again moved fast with their plans. General Nadashti, with 14,000 light infantry, reached Friedland, where he set up camp. Prince Charles was moving on to Reichenberg. Frederick's scouts reported that the Austrian army had already crossed the Saxon frontier in early November. In response, Frederick dispatched his trusted hussar commander von Zieten to hinder the Austrians from linking up with the Saxons at Dresden. Frederick himself, he departed from Potsdam and he ordered the Old de Sauer to redeploy his quartered army. Von Zieten's hussars were the first to engage in serious combat during the winter campaign. On November 23rd, one Saxon infantry regiment and three cavalry regiments defended Katholisch Hennersdorf. Noticing the enemy, Zieten's hussars charged again. After brief but savage fighting, the Saxons retreated, losing over 900 soldiers. Only nine miles away was Prince Charles's army. Its lack of supplies, poor morale, and contradictory orders by generals wasn't a good foreboding. Instead of coming to the Saxons' aid, Charles learned the Prussians outnumbered his 18,000-strong army nearly three to one. 
He ordered the retreat back into Bohemia. It appeared the Austrian offensive was averted before it had ever begun. Charles lost over 5,000 soldiers, whereas Prussia lost no more than 100. Frederick wrote, I have done everything that a general can do with the least spilling of blood and with the greatest results. He wasn't wrong, and this did not go unnoticed among the Saxons and Austrians either. Soon after the battle, they received the British envoy carrying Frederick's instructions to offer them a moderate peace. Despite the initial refusal, the Saxon ministers did open negotiations, and the prospects seemed rather promising. Still, Frederick bombarded his mentor, the old de Sauer, with letters ordering him to fall on the Saxons. So as the negotiations were ongoing, de Sauer scored victory after victory, crushing the poorly garrisoned Leipzig and forcing the Saxon field marshal, Frederick Augustus, Count Rutowski, to fall back nearby Dresden. It has to be said that the de Sauer completed these tasks with an unhealthy dose of aversion. Surviving correspondence between Frederick and him reveal he did not shy away from giving his opinion on the forced marches and battles during midwinter. His men were tired, and he refused to carry out Frederick's order several times. Some correspondence implies that if things had gone differently, de Sauer would be a suitable candidate for court marshalling. But unbeknownst to both commanders, in the background, peace negotiations were ongoing and looked more optimistic by the day. Still, following the king's orders, de Sauer advanced onto Dresden. Finally, on December 15, both armies met near Kesselsdorf, slightly south of the capital. It was a cold and misty afternoon with light snow. The old de Sauer and his army marched onto Dresden from the west, when scouts informed him of Field Marshal Rutowski and the Saxon main army holding the ground from Kesselsdorf to Ockerwitz. The old Prussian commander, 69 years old at this point, commanded a 32,000 strong Prussian army. Field Marshal Rutowski commanded a 35,000 strong Saxon army. Rutowski's Saxons were positioned along the Schonerbach River. The Austrian contingent under General Grüner was positioned on the outskirts of Ockerwitz towards the Elbe River. Rutowski ordered his infantry in Kesselsdorf to fortify the town with solid defenses and artillery. In the early afternoon, the old de Sauer's army approached Kesselsdorf. His army spanned from the southwest all the way to the north, opposite of the Saxon right flank. As the entire army approached, de Sauer ordered his infantry in the south to launch a frontal charge against the heavily fortified Kesselsdorf. Among the vanguard, charging towards the city, were his and Holt Grenadiers. Thanks to the strategic positioning of the artillery and the general fortifications, the infantry charge against Kesselsdorf experienced fierce resistance. The Prussian soldiers marched on despite continuous artillery shots fired against them. They suffered enormous casualties. As the infantry continued their charge, the Prussian infantry to their north and the cavalry on their left flank began their assault as well. However, the banks of the Schonerbach River were muddy and the terrain was difficult to cross in general. Consequently, Saxon artillery fired against the Prussian infantry and cavalry crossing the stream. Certain locations saw skirmishes erupt, but large-scale battles did not ensue, for both parties were too hindered by the terrain. Meanwhile, to the south of Kesselsdorf, the first infantry wave eventually had to retreat despite their discipline. The charge simply was not sustainable. They suffered hefty losses. Things were not looking good for the Prussians, and the Saxons also knew it. With sky-high morale and confident they would deal the Prussians a decisive blow, the Saxon defenders of Kesselsdorf leapt over their defensive positions to give chase against the Prussians. It is uncertain if this was a direct order, or if it was a spur-of-the-moment decision by the Saxon infantry. What is for sure is that once they left their defensive positions, the Saxons were exposed to whatever Prussian soldiers remained outside Kesselsdorf. Consequently, a 2nd Grenadier regiment launched a counterattack. The Prussians clashed heavily with the Saxons. Brief, heavy combat broke out, but the Prussian iron discipline proved superior. Understanding their mistake by leaving their fortified positions, the Saxon lines quickly deteriorated into an uncoordinated route. 
The Saxon left flank suffered the brunt of the damage, leading to them being pushed north towards the center lines. Despite only minor skirmishes happening throughout the entire center line, the Prussians had a minor advantage there too. When the Saxon defenders in the center line learned of their retreating comrades to the south, the center line began showing cracks as well. Because of the lack of aid from the Austrian general Grüne, we can safely assume the lines of communication between the Saxons and the Austrians were subpar. Shortly before dark, the entire center line deteriorated into a rout. Butowski had lost central command for a while already and could do nothing but leave his position. As for the Austrians, their only contribution was joining the Saxons in flight once they noticed their positions breaking. The Saxons and Austrians fled all the way to Prince Charles' army. Dessauer decided not to pursue them, but instead sent word to the king of his victory. In total, the Prussians lost 3,500 men, of whom a thousand died. The Saxons suffered 3,000 fatalities. 5,000 more were captured. Relatively speaking, it was quite an expensive victory for the already thinned out Prussian army, but international developments would soon mitigate these losses and turn the modest victory into a great one. This was an incredible victory for Prussia despite the casualties. Still, in a letter, Frederick made the sober remark that it was better to suffer the dead at Dresden than at Berlin. Fate had it that the victory was unnecessary. As the Sauer and Rutowski were fighting the battle, unbeknownst to them, Frederick received word from the British envoy. King Augustus, doubling as Saxony's elector, agreed to the proposed peace terms. The Austrian envoy, too, supposedly agreed to these terms. If anything, the victory at Dresden strengthened Prussia's position. Frederick obviously was delighted, and when both armies linked up near Dresden two days later, Frederick dismounted and embraced his old mentor. The bad blood had been forgotten. The following day, after the surrender of the small Saxon garrison defending Dresden, the Prussians victoriously rode into the Saxon capital. Maria Theresa could do nothing but concede a military solution wasn't viable. On Christmas Day in 1745, both parties signed the Peace of Dresden. It ended the Second Silesian War. Maria Theresa confirmed the contents of the Treaty of Breslau, acknowledging Prussia's sovereignty over Silesia and the Duchy of Graz. In return, Frederick guaranteed the Habsburg lands and agreed to vote for Francis, Maria Theresa's husband, as Holy Roman Emperor. Saxony had to pay Prussia one million thalers as war indemnity. And for those who wonder, Frederick's dog, stolen at the Battle of Sor, was returned to him preceding the final battle. In his history of my own times, Frederick himself wrote that the war had cost him eight million thalers. By the time he signed the peace, he was left with just 15,000 in his treasury. Despite this, upon his return to Berlin, he was given a hero's welcome and hailed as Frederick the Great for the first time. The young king likely played a vital role in the propaganda campaign resulting in this flattering sobriquet. The War of the Austrian Succession ended up lasting three more years. Frederick's ally France was largely left to fight it out on its own. As it became more or less customary, the French did not find out about Frederick's peace until after he actually signed it. Just like before in November 1741 and the Treaty of Breslau in 1742, they were livid. For now, they were stuck in a war of which the outcome was still uncertain. But whether they would emerge victoriously or not, they wouldn't forget Frederick's betrayals. After this video, I will create another video delving in the so-called subsequent diplomatic revolution. This period followed the War of the Austrian Succession and led to a significant shift in alliances within Europe. And 11 years after the peace, the Seven Years' War broke out, which I plan to cover in its entirety. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there's a topic, battle or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you already gain early access to my videos. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.